Let's have a tutorial on a magnetic circuit of a very special configuration, that of an induction motor. The magnetic circuit of an induction motor is in essence a cylinder inside another cylinder. That is the external cylinder, the hollow cylinder. On the inner face of that cylinder, the manufacturer carves lengthwise slots in that and inserts conductors in them and winds them together into coils, as is shown. Now in the middle of that goes another cylinder separated from this one by a small air gap. Let's have a look at the cross section of such machine. In this one we have only one coil represented in a pair of slots, one on the top and one on the bottom. Let's read the problem. The magnetic circuit of an induction motor consists of a solid cylinder of ferromagnetic material. The actual one is not solid but laminated, but this is our first assignment with a cylindrical magnetic circuit, so it's been simplified this way. That cylinder is encased in the middle of a hollow cylinder of the same alloy as shown in this figure. There you see the internal solid cylinder and the external hollow cylinder and both are separated by an air gap. The internal cylinder has a diameter of 70 centimeters and a length into the pitch into the screen of 21 centimeters. The surrounding hollow cylinder is separated from the solid one by an air gap of 4.9 centimeters. Now, in two slots carved lengthwise on the internal surface of the hollow cylinder, we install a coil with 12 turns. And in that coil, we put a DC current of 7.5 amperes. There is your coil. Your task is to find what is the magnetic field H at any point in the air gap. Consider H as positive if it's coming out of the rotor. What rotor? the solid cylinder is called a rotor and negative if it's entering the rotor. The position on the air gap is given by the angle alpha as in the figure. See alpha is zero on the top and 90 degrees to the right, 180 on the bottom and so on. The number of turns, 12. The current in the coil, 7.5 amperes. The air gap, 4.9 centimeters. The radius of each one of the cylinders are A and RB are 35 centimeters and 39.9 centimeters. The length of the whole machine into the page, into the screen is 21 centimeters. Now, because they tell us that the ferromagnetic material has an infinite permeability mu, we conclude that the magnetic field inside the iron is null, is zero, is not. Let's take that Ampere's trajectory. What is special about that trajectory? It has symmetry. It has odd symmetry with respect to the currents in the circuit. Because of that symmetry, we can say safely that the magnetic field here and there in the air gap have the same value, but opposite directions, right? One negative, one positive. The total MMF applied by the currents to that trajectory is given by Ampere's law. It is a total sum of amps entering the surface bounded by that red trajectory, which is of course n times i. But given the symmetry, the magnetic potential drop across one of the air gaps is half the total. So the magnetic potential drop in one of them is ni divided by 2, and that should be equal to the integral of the magnetic field going between Ra and Rb. If we assume that that magnetic field is constant along the radius of the machine in the air gap, we can approximate that expression to this simpler one and from there find an approximated value for the magnetic field in the air gap, Ni divided by 2 delta naught. However, we know that H in reality is not constant, it is radial, it's higher the closer we get to the internal cylinder. Let's see the details of that. Let's take a wedge of that circuit with a width of alpha radians. In that wedge, the one thing that is constant is the flux. The number of lines remains constant between the external cylinder and the internal one. In that diagram, we are given Ra, Rb, 
and then we include a third imaginary cylinder at a distance x from the center from the axle of the machine. We can compute what is the flux density at a distance x from the center. We divide that total flux in that wedge and by the area of that segment of the cylinder, of the imaginary cylinder. That would be phi divided by L, the length of the machine, divided by the arc, which is alpha radians multiplied by the radius x. If we divide that flux density by mu sub naught, we get the magnetic field as a function of x, the distance to the center of the machine. And now we are ready. The magnetic potential in the air gap, we've seen before, is Ni divided by 2. But that has to be equal to the integral between Ra and Rb of the magnetic field. What is that integral? Integral of 1 over x with respect to the x, that is the natural logarithm of x. That integral would be natural logarithm of Rb minus the natural logarithm of Ra, which is the natural logarithm of Rb over Ra, of course. In that expression, we solve for this term. And we substitute that in the expression above for the magnetic field. And look, the magnetic field as a function of all the parameters we know, n, i, r, a, and r, b. At a distance x from the center is given by that expression. If we evaluate that at r, a, we get the answer to our problem. The problem asks us, what is the magnetic field right on the surface of the internal cylinder? And that's what it is. Now you want numbers, right? I'll give you numbers. Evaluate that at our A. And we have our A. And the value you get is 981 amps per meter. But the question is asking us, represent the magnetic field in amps per millimeter. Fine, divide by 1,000. And that is 0.98 amperes per millimeter. What would have happened if we had used the simplification, the approximation uh, that h is approximately constant in the air gap, this approximation. If you do that, look, the value you would have gotten would have been this. Now you answer to me, was it worth it all the pain? Well, for the first time it was so that we can convince ourselves uh, that the approximation is good enough in most cases. What about the rest of the air gap? The same analysis can be applied to any point alpha along the air gap. So, the magnetic field has a space shape of a square wave, like that. Between 0 degrees and 180 degrees, it has a constant positive value. And between 180 and 360, the same value but negative inside. What would have happened if the current was not constant? What if that current was changing sinusoidally with time? Well, as the current decreases, so does the magnetic field everywhere in the air gap. At one point, the sinusoidal current is zero, and so is the magnetic field. And a fraction of a second later, the current is reversed, and so is the magnetic field. Right? So we have a magnetic field in the air gap that is pulsating. Its space shape is still square, um, but it's changing with time. It's pulsating with time sinusoidally. Now I have a challenge for you all. Now I have a challenge for you all. What if instead of having one coil, we had three? Look, the coil we have, we label A. And then we insert 120 degrees away here, another coil that we will call coil B. And then again, another 120 uh, in degrees away, we install the third coil, and we call that C. In each one of the coils, we will put a sinusoidal current. This one in A, this one in B, and that one in C. What can you tell me of those currents? Well, they are sinusoidal. Yeah, what else? They have the same frequency, 300 radians per second. Yeah, that's correct. What else? They have the same peak value, 10 amperes. What else? The first one has a phase of 0 degrees, the second negative 120 degrees, and the third one, positive 120, that is negative 240 degrees. They are out of phase by 120 degrees with respect to the other two. Now here's your challenge. Find me how the magnetic field in the air gap will change with time given that distribution of coils and the setup of currents. You know whose challenge is that? No other than Mr. Nikola Tesla.
He solved his problem and his name become legend. And with that, my friends, that is all I have to say for now. So long and thank you for all the fish.